for this morning. Hey, good morning. I am uh, so pleased and privileged to be, uh, to be here this morning. And uh, as Scott has already said, uh, Pastor Mike is en route to, uh, to New York. And so he has asked me to uh, fill in here this morning uh, and uh, go to preach uh, from the pulpit here. And uh, I am just so abundantly grateful uh, for an opportunity to be here this morning and uh, to be able to open God's word with you. I'm going to pray once more, because there's no such thing as too much prayer. So let's just go before the Lord as we, uh, we, we get into this this morning. God, may you be glorified in this place. I pray, Father, that you would just speak through me and use me here this morning as only you can. God, I pray that you would just work in the hearts of those who are here. God, I, I don't know what you're about to do, but you do. And so I just pray that you would just work in the hearts of those who are here. Open the ears and open the hearts so that those who are on the outside would come in through the cross this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. The Appalachian Trail. The Appalachian Trail is 2,190 miles long. It is a hiking trail that begins in Georgia and makes its way all the way up to Maine. Now, I didn't know this until this week. Thank you, Wikipedia. Uh, but the Appalachian Trail is the world's longest hiking-only footpath. And uh, it takes half a year to hike this trail. It takes pe most people five to seven months to hike the Appalachian Trail. I mean, can you believe that? Half a year devoted to hiking from Georgia to Maine. And every year, thousands of people try to accomplish this task. But only about one quarter of those who start out actually make it all the way. Now, I want you all to know that I personally have met somebody who has uh, hiked the Appalachian Trail. Uh, one summer, I got to know a coworker. Uh, I believe his name was Tom, and he had spent a semester, he had actually taken a semester off from college and hiked and completed the Appalachian Trail. And listening to Tom about his six-month journey, uh, in this, on this mountain, on the east, these, this mountain trail on the East Coast. It was fascinating. Um, but before meeting him, I, I'd imagine each day would be this grueling, exhausting, gut-wrenching day of climbing. But Tom told me that most days were not that bad. You see, when you're already up on the mountains, all you have to do is continue on to the next peak. You, you sort of get into this rhythm of hiking high above on the trail, uh, doing ridge walking, as they call it, from peak to peak. The tough days, the difficult days, Tom would say, was when you'd have to leave the mountain and descend into the valley below. When food was low and Tom would have to get more supplies, he would have to climb down from the mountains, find his way into a town, purchase more supplies, only to climb back up to the trail where he was before. Up and down, down and up. That is the life of someone spending half a year hiking the Appalachian Trail. And descending into the valley is never enjoyable. Life can be a lot like hiking. Now, I know I, I am speaking to a room full of Floridians, but we've all experienced the ups and downs of life. We, we all have good days and bad days, seasons of great joy and times of immense sorrow. And God has made them both. Ecclesiastes 7.14 tells us so. Ecclesiastes 7.14 says, In the day of prosperity, be joyful. 
And in the day of adversity, consider, God has made the one as well as the other, so that man may not find out anything that will be after him. God has made the day of prosperity and goodness and blessing, and he has also made the day of difficulty and sorrow and pain. It's a mixed bag, really, life. And for most of us, we don't live on the mountain. Life is often spent somewhere between the mountaintop experience and the deep valley below. But there are times and seasons when we find ourselves in the valley, in the disappointments, the discouragements, and the difficulties of life on this earth. So how do we navigate life in the valley? Open your Bible to Genesis chapter 40. Genesis 40 is where we're going to be looking at today. Now, when I was a kid, and still, honestly, it's today, I loved and love banana bread. I mean, I can remember when my mom would make a fresh banana bread, and you just, the whole house would smell of sweet, freshly baked banana bread. And, and growing up in a large family, I always wanted to make sure I had the largest piece. Right? Okay. <laughs> you following me? So do you know what the best slice of banana bread is? It's the middle piece. Because the loaf, is, it kind of has a shape to it, and the tallest, fattest piece is right there in the middle. So I'd let my siblings get the first few pieces, and I would go for number four or five in the row. And in fact, sometimes I would just cut right into the middle, because I knew that was the best. So we're going to cut right into the middle of the story of Joseph this morning. We're going to look at the middle portion of this narrative in Genesis. Joseph. And many of you are familiar with Joseph and his Technicolor dream coat. Or perhaps you're familiar with bits and pieces of the story. Joseph, he's famous for a number of things. Uh, his coat of many colors being the favorite of his father, his dreams, and the interpretation of these dreams. And at one turning point of the story of Joseph, we find that Joseph, by the power of God, he interprets Pharaoh, king of Egypt's dream, foretelling seven years of plenty and seven years of famine. Many of you remember this. And that's actually a good way to look at Joseph's life as well. Many years of favor and favoritism and prosperity and also many years, many, many years of difficulty and despair. When we first meet Genesis, I mean uh, Joseph in Genesis chapter 37, he is 17 years old, a junior in, or maybe a senior in high school, if you will. Genesis 34, verses 3 four, through 4 says this. Now Israel loved Joseph more than any of his other sons because he was the son of his old age, and he made him a robe of many colors. But when his brothers saw that their father loved him more than all his brothers, they hated him and could not speak peacefully to him. Joseph, he's the, his, is Joseph, is his father, Israel, otherwise known as Jacob's favorite child. And he is the 11th, 11th of Jacob's 12 sons. He should have been a nobody, left with little to no inheritance. But instead, dad loves Joseph the most. And for this, his 10 older brothers hate him. Hate him. And this isn't just a hatred like, I hate cranberry sauce on Thanksgiving. No, this is a deep, passionate, true hatred. It is the type of hatred that Jesus refers to in the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapter 5. 
A hatred that starts where hatred always starts in the heart and leads to murder. And that's that's their plan. They want to kill Joseph. Kill him. But instead of killing Joseph, they sell him. I mean, while they're figuring out what to do with this Joseph problem, this favorite of dad, you know, maybe they're going, do we kill our kid brother um, or not? Do we kill him today? Some passing traders come by and they decide to sell him for 20 shekels of silver. So he's sold as a slave in Egypt where he serves the Egyptian captain of the guard, Potiphar. But things only go from bad to worse for young Joseph because Mrs. Potiphar decides to make a move on young, handsome, rugged Joseph. He resists her advances, and she falsely accuses him of coming on to her. And he's thrown into prison. If anyone knew the difficulty of life, it was Joseph. It was Joseph. And he does nothing to deserve what he receives. At the age of 17, he is hated by his own family, enslaved in a country 400 miles from his home, falsely accused of sexual advances, and now he is imprisoned for no good reason. All of these things happen to Joseph. We, we too often focus on the upswing of this story when Joseph is released from prison and is given a place of power and prominence. But when that finally happens, Genesis 41, verse 46 tells us Joseph is 30 years old. Just let this sink in for a moment this morning. That means Joseph spent 13 years of his life as a slave or in prison. 13 years. If anyone knew difficulty in life, it was Joseph. Psalm 13. Psalm 13. It begins with this downer of a line. How long, O Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? When life gets difficult, it is easy to echo the sentiment of King David in this psalm. Where are you, God? How long will you ignore me? How long will you not answer my prayers? Why are you hiding on my day of difficulty? And life can be difficult. The Bible does not hold back any punches on that fact. Just read the book of Ecclesiastes sometime. My grandfather, he famously would say, everyone has their trial. Everyone has their trial. Everyone has difficulty. Perhaps you have lost your job at an inopportune time and now you don't know how you're gonna pay for groceries. Everyone has difficulty. Or sickness and disease has crippled and weakened your once thriving body. Perhaps you have a loved one who died too early. Maybe it's just that you've been waiting, waiting so long for God to answer that one prayer of your heart. That you'll be married. That you'll have a child. That you'll get out of that terrible situation you're currently in. That your own prodigal son or daughter or spouse or friend would finally turn from their sins and come to Jesus. But things haven't changed. And the dark day is still here. You're still living in the valley. Where's God? Is He still at work? Friends, I want you to hear this today. God is with us in difficulty. 
God is with us in difficulty. He does not abandon us on the day of our trouble. No, the, this truth is echoed from Genesis through Revelation. And we find it here in the Joseph narrative as well. In Genesis 39 alone, we find it written four different times that God was with Joseph. Four times. In verses 2, 3, 21, and 23, it is explicitly written that God is with Joseph. In the house of slavery, when he was being falsely accused, when he was thrown into prison, God was with him. And God is with you in whatever difficulty you are currently facing or you will one day face. God is with you. He does not abandon us when life gets tough. And this is where we find Je Joseph in Genesis chapter 40. He's somewhere along those 13 years of difficulty. And he's in prison. Falsely accused for something he didn't do. The injustice of Joseph's situation is palpable. But there's, that's where he is. But Joseph's not alone in prison. Read with me in Genesis chapter 40, verses 1 through 6. Well, we'll start today, and I'm reading from the English Standard Version. Sometime after this, the cupbearer of the king of Egypt and his baker committed an offense against their lord, the king of Egypt. And Pharaoh was angry with his two officers, the chief cupbearer and the chief baker, and he put them in custody in the house of the captain of the guard in the prison where Joseph was confined. The captain of the guard appointed Joseph to be with them, and he attended them. They continued for some time in custody. And one night, they both dreamed. The cupbearer and the baker of the king of Egypt who were confined in the prison, each his, his own dream, and each dream with its own interpretation. When Joseph came to them in the morning, he saw that they were troubled. Verse 7. So he asked Pharaoh's officers who were with him in custody in his master's house, why are your faces downcast today? Stop there for a moment. Do you realize that whatever difficulty that you are going through, there may be others going through the same thing? Joseph has in, been in prison now for, I love it, it says for some time. Good general time, sometime, somewhere along 13 years, he's there. And who would show up but two of Pharaoh's top officers? His chief cupbearer and his chief baker. And now these two are undergoing the exact same punishment that Joseph has been dealing with. They're inside of a jail cell. And, and Joseph, he takes notice of these two. I love his question. Why are your faces downcast today? And I don't know about you, but if I was the baker or the uh, cupbearer and I got this question, it'd be hard not to be sarcastic. Like, uh, look around, Joseph. We're in prison. <laughs> of course I'm upset. As if being in prison uh, was not a good enough reason to be upset. But there was something different about these two men today. And Joseph took notice. Joseph was able to see beyond his own discouragement and look towards the needs of others. This takes remarkable compassion. All too often when I'm in the valley, all too often on those days of difficulty and discouragement, when things have gone sideways and the pains of life seem to echo in my ears, it feels nearly impossible for me to see beyond myself. But Joseph reminds us that others are with us in difficulty. Others are with us in difficulty. When we are living in the valley, when our life is dark and difficult, it is our natural inclination to get out of whatever difficulty we have found ourselves in as soon as possible. 
we start saying if only phrases. Like, if only I had this one thing. If only God would answer that one prayer. Or if only I could just feel better. You find yourself yearning for the day when life will be easier than it is right now. But perhaps, perhaps God has something for you today while you're still sitting in the valley. Something for you to learn or someone who is right there with you, who is God is calling you to love and minister to. What opportunities has God given you through difficulties that you otherwise would not have had? I'm reminded of the words of Jesus while he's hanging on the cross. Uh, how others-minded Jesus was. He's hanging there, bruised and bleeding, barely recognizable, and it is in, in physical agony. And as he looks down, he sees his earthly mother, Mary. And who's there with her but John, one of his closest followers. And Jesus knows the needs his mother will have once he departs. Think about this. He is in physical agony and pain. He is feeling all the weight of what he is going through. And yet he thinks of Mary and her next needs after he departs. So he commissions John in compassion to take care of his mom. John 19, verses 26 through 27 says, When Jesus saw his mother and the disciples whom he loved standing nearby, he said to his mother, Woman, behold your son. Then he said to the disciple, Behold your mother. And from that hour, the disciple took her to his own home. God is with us in the valley. And as we walk through the darkness with our good shepherd, as we walk through the darkness in the valley of the shadow of death, with the good shepherd who guides us, he may nudge us towards others. He, he may have opportunities unique to seasons such as this. And, and do not hear me wrong. There are times to grieve and find solace and solitude. There are times to seek help for yourself. But in these times, God may bring a cupbearer or a baker into your prison cell for you to minister to. And perhaps God will use the difficulty of today to bless others going through their own similar valleys tomorrow. Joseph sees the cupbearer and baker's downcast faces, and he asks what's wrong. Verse 7. So he asked Pharaoh's officers who were with him in custody in his master's house, Why are your faces downcast today? They said to him, We have had dreams, and there is no one to interpret them. And Joseph said to them, Do not interpretations belong to God? Please tell them to me. So the chief cupbearer told his dream to Joseph and said to him, In my dream there was a vine before me, and on the vine there were three branches. As soon as it budded, it blossoms, its blossoms shot forth, and the clusters ripened its grapes. Pharaoh's cup was in my hand, and I took the grapes and pressed them into Pharaoh's cup and placed the cup in Pharaoh's hand. Then Joseph said to him, this is the interpretation. The three branches are three days. In three days, Pharaoh will lift up your head, and restore you to your office. And you shall place Pharaoh's cup in his hand, as formerly, when you were his cupbearer. Only remember me when it is well with you, and please do me the kindness to mention me to Pharaoh, and so to get me out of this house, where I was indeed stolen out of the land of the Hebrews. And here also I have done nothing that should put me into this pit." I have a very simple and fun assignment for all of you today. Uh, it's, it's enjoyable. Uh, if you're going out to lunch this afternoon, uh, or maybe the next time you were friends, uh, ask them, what is the strangest dream you've ever had? 
every time I've gone down this tangent with my friends, uh, I always come to the realization that some of my closest pe people in my life have some really freaky subconsciences. Now, Joseph, he's not commenting, commenting on the strangeness of this dream. I mean, it's weird. But instead of this, he takes the opportunity to point to God as the one who gives interpretations of dreams. He's not taking the credit on himself. We have to think of Joseph as this guy who interpreted dreams. He was the king of dreams. No, God is the one who brings meaning and understanding. God is the one who reveals mysteries. God is one, the one who opens the eyes. God is the one who allows us to see and understand. God is this amazing revealer of dreams and mysteries, not Joseph. And the, the Egyptians, they had a pantheon of gods. But Joseph stands on the truth of who God is, the revealer of mysteries. In the New Testament, Paul, the apostle, oftentimes talks about the gospel as the mystery that has been revealed for our time. That, that God was holding like a curtain over what he was about to do in the fullness of time. That is, send his son Jesus into this world. And at just the right time, God sent Christ to die for the ungodly. And that is the good news of the gospel. That we, we don't deserve God's love, but God in his wisdom at the right time in history, sent his son Jesus into this world. And he revealed this mystery to ordinary people like us. And perhaps you're here today and you've never had the mystery revealed. And I would just encourage you, consider. Consider Jesus, for he is the one who all of this points to. Joseph knew God as the revealer of mysteries. And so Joseph explains this interpretation of the dreams. And it, it's going to be a great outcome for the cupbearer. Three days are represented by three vines, three branches. And in three days, the cupbearer will be restored to his previous post. This interpretation gives hopes and redemption for the cupbearer. And I also want you to notice that Joseph, he doesn't diminish his difficulties. He, he is well aware of the injustice that has been done to him throughout his life. And he's not diminishing it when he ministers to these two. In fact, he is so bold to call upon Pharaoh, the king of Egypt, the, one of the greatest leaders and powers in the world at that time, that he would come and rescue him from this injustice he endured. Never be afraid to speak out the difficulties that are going on in your life. Some of us can be so sheepish, thinking, oh, uh, woe is me. No, just, Joseph is not sheepish in this story. He ministers to the people God has put him in this jail cell, in the prison, in the valley. He ministers to them but he also is bold to share his own difficulties and his own injustice in humility and in compassion. Now, before the, the cupbearer even has an opportunity to respond, we see, uh, we see the, uh, the baker. He just jumps in on this chance. He sees how good the first interpretation was, and he's like, I want in on the action. <laughs> so when the, verse 16, when the chief baker saw that the interpretation was favorable, he said to Joseph, I also had a dream. There were three cake baskets on my head. And in the uppermost basket, there were all sorts of baked food for Pharaoh. But the birds were eating it out of the basket on my head. And Joseph answered and said, this is the interpretation. The three baskets are three days. And in three days, Pharaoh will lift up your head from you. And hang you on a tree. And the birds will eat the flesh from you. Could you imagine the look on the baker's face? How quickly his face must have fallen. 
tell me. Oh, and we laugh, but this is tragic. I mean, he happily wants to hear the good news that's coming his way. But all he receives is torment and death. The cupbearer's interpretation was one of redemption, but the baker only received an interpretation that led to his execution. Maybe, maybe they didn't believe Joseph. They wrote him off as crazy. But regardless of what they felt, God, who gave the interpretation, proved to be true. God is true and faithful regardless of circumstances. God is true and faithful regardless of circumstances. God does not change. And aren't we thankful for that? God does not change based on our ever-changing emotions and setting that we find ourselves in. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And we can trust in the enduring nature of the eternal God when we are in the valley. We can trust the enduring nature of the eternal God on our most difficult days. Continuing on in verse 20. On the third day, which was Pharaoh's birthday, he made a feast for all of his servants and lifted up the head of the chief cupbearer and the head of the chief baker among his servants. He restored the chief cupbearer to his position and he placed the cup in the Pharaoh's hand. But he hanged the chief baker as Joseph had interpreted to them. Yet the chief cupbearer did not remember Joseph, but forgot him. Final, final words of Genesis 40 are haunting, aren't they? The cupbearer forgot Joseph. You can imagine that he was so elated as he was released that this Hebrew sl slave he was so elated when he was released that this Hebrew slave must have just slipped his mind. I mean, how could it? Joseph had, had, after all, foretold his restoration. When he was asked why he was released, would the cupbearer have mentioned Joseph? Well, how does this come about? You were released on, on Pharaoh's birthday. Oh, like, I don't know. How did he forget Joseph? He sadly did. And the very next verse we find in chapter 41 tells us that Joseph sat in that prison cell for two more years. Our days of difficulty may not end in the time that we expect. I'm sure Joseph would have thought that his rescue was going to come any day now that the cupbearer could tell Pharaoh all about him. But he sat in prison for another 730 days, two years. And day after day, he must have wondered, how much longer is this ordeal going to go on? I grew up in a small town in uh, just an hour south of Fairbanks, Alaska. And uh, uh, this little town is called Ninana, uh, rhymes with banana. Uh, and it was a very small town. We're talking like teeny, like blink and you miss it literally as you're driving by it. Uh, and it was so small, in fact, that whenever I, we needed groceries or we had to go see the doctor or we had any appointment or errand, you'd have to drive 50 miles north to Fairbanks. And winters in Alaska are dark. And with the darkness comes cold and snow, and ice. And I can remember many nights driving home from Fairbanks with my family, and as we drove on the windy, dangerous roads, sometimes we could only see so far into the darkness. Perhaps it was snowing. And all our headlights of our van could see was the next 10 to 20 feet in front of us. It was dark and dangerous in the abyss. I often think of the difficulties of life like that road. 
we can only see so far as to what God has for us. We don't know how long the difficulty will last, but we do know this. God is with us. And we can trust him. Joseph was forgotten by the cupbearer. But throughout his story, we are reminded that God never forgot him. He was with him throughout all of his difficulties. And my friends, you are not forgotten by God. You are not forgotten by God. We have so many voices that tell us that you are not enough. But God, in his love, said, you are enough because I, am will I sent my son to this earth to die for you. You want to know how much God cares for you? Look to the cross. If you want to know how much God cares for you, consider this. He even knows every hair that is counted on your head. He cares about the details of your life. There are billions of people on this earth and God is interested in you because he loves you. God does not forget us. He is close to the brokenhearted and he knows how your story is going to end. Romans 8, 28 says this, and we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good, for those who are called according to his purpose. And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good, for those who are called according to his purpose. Romans 8, 28. This verse can come off as a cliche answer to someone who's in the middle of a valley. It can sound ingenuine and hurtful. Oh, don't worry. God will work everything out for good about it. God's in charge. But we see time and time again in scripture that God is with us in difficulty and that God uses difficulty for his good. He is not the author of evil, but in his sovereignty, he uses human evil. He uses the discouragement and the disappointment of this life for his ultimate good. D.A. Carson reflects on this phenomenon in his book, How Long, O Lord? Reflections on Suffering and Evil, when he writes, apart from the cross itself, one of the clearest examples of this is the treatment of Joseph. He was sold into slavery out of the malice of his brothers. Their intent was wholly evil, and for years, Joseph's experience was appalling. Yet he came to see that his brother's intent was not the only one operating. You intended to harm me, he told them, but God meant it for good. Life in the valley is not fun. It's not. It's difficult. And it can be painful. Yet God is always with us. Working in us. And everything is for our good always. Let's pray.